Everybody who has a smartphone has a GPS receiver inside their phone, and they don't have an atomic clock. So how does this, how do we determine our position more accurately, given that we have a, a worse performing clock in our phone or other ground GPS receivers? So I'm going to do a little thought experiment with you all to try and illustrate how this, this process works. It's a very simplified example, but the fundamentals are true for the more complicated situations in which we use navigation with GPS. So I'm going to go to flat land, a two-dimensional uh, space. And I have three GPS satellites indicated here in the corners. And I'm somewhere in here. And I'm trying to figure out where I'm at. And I'm going to take measurements with my GPS receiver that's in my phone. And the way in which this works is I'll get signals from each one of these satellites instantaneously and simultaneously. With that first measurement, I'll get a measure of range. And the way this works is the satellite will essentially send a signal on the tone the time is. Um, and when I receive it, wherever I'm at, I'll have a measure of range as well as how off, a measure of how far off my, my local clock is. So the GPS satellites are about 20,000 kilometers in altitude. It takes about 70 milliseconds for that signal to uh, arrive here on Earth. I'm going to compare that time to what my phone says, and I'm going to have some measure of this distance plus the error in my clock. So with that singular measurement, I could be anywhere in this band where the band represents my clock error. So with the second GPS measurement, I have this measure of range, and I can be anywhere in this band. But if I combine the two of them, I'm somewhere in this football-shaped region. So I've now actually fixed myself somewhere here with just two measurements, but I still don't know my time. I need a third measurement. With that third measurement, my location gets more precise, and now I have another piece of information that says, your clock's time is x. So that's, in a nutshell, how our receivers in our phones and other GPS receivers work today. But it's still not good enough for deep space navigation. We don't have a plethora of satellites distributed across the solar system to do that kind of navigation job. What we do have is the deep space network. The deep space network was formed uh, about the time that NASA was formed at the end of the 1950s. And the way in which we get tracking data to our satellites and our probes and spacecraft are through these rather humongous antennas. If this picture over here, this is the feed horn of this 70 meter antenna out in Goldstone in California. And that's a person standing on the end. They're big. And the reason why they're big is that they need to transmit a very powerful signal to spacecraft and satellites that are hundreds of millions of kilometers away. Those satellites don't have the transmission power to return it. So these antennas, um, excuse me, they do have the power to return it. They have high gain antennas on them as well. Um, but it starts with a large transmission um, from one of these stations. And you can imagine that there's, there are only three DSN complexes uh, on the Earth. They're separated longitudinally by 120 degrees, so that typically there's always one DSN station in view of a spacecraft or many spacecraft that are in our solar system. And the way in which this system works, it uses ranging like the GPS, but we use two-way ranging typically today. And the reason why we use two-way ranging and Doppler is that the spacecraft clocks aren't good enough. At best, they have USOs today. And those USOs aren't stable enough so that the one-way signals we get with them will allow us to navigate accurately and precisely. Um, so the way the two-way signal works is it will send that tone. Um, at a certain time, it will send it up to the spacecraft. The spacecraft will turn it around and be received here back at Earth. And that's where the measurement takes place. And then on the ground, we'll process that data to figure out the, the trajectory of the spacecraft. Now, you can imagine that um, you need precision clocks and frequency sources in the stations. And we do. We have very precise, stable atomic standards. And Alan will talk to you and show you pictures of how big they are. Um, but they're very stable and precise. In fact, they only drift about a tenth of a nanosecond per day. It's an extremely tiny number. 
this is good enough for deep space navigation. So I'm going to do another thought experiment and illustrate um, how we do deep space navigation with these kinds of signals. And before I do that, uh, we have to keep in mind some of the lessons we learned about Earth-based navigation. We're in the solar system. We're traveling about. We need to figure out where we're at. What we need is a reference system. So on Earth, we had latitude and longitude. In deep space, we have a three-dimensional coordinate system that we define usually at the center, near the center of the sun. And we need a map. We need a map of where our destinations are, the trajectories of our planets and moons and asteroids. And with this map and this coordinate system and the DSN tracking data, we can resolve locations and trajectories of spacecraft. Um, but unlike GPS, where we didn't need precision models of how spacecraft move, because, the fact, because of only having maybe a single DSN station in view at any given time, we need precise models of how spacecraft move in space. For those of you who had a college physics class, these are the equations of motion that you were taught back in that day. And there are a number of forces that perturb the motion of spacecraft that are transiting through the solar system. Of course, all of the gravitational tugs of each of, of the planets needs to be accounted for. The fact that the gravity field at any given planet is non-uniform tugs on a spacecraft. The fact that the sun shines light, beams energy on a spacecraft, pushes it around too. We need to account for that. We need to account for the fact that space isn't flat. Einstein told us that it's curved. And so time will change its rate based on where we're at in the, gra in the gravity wells of each of these uh, solar system bodies. We have to account for that. We have to account for little gases that are emanating for our spacecraft. All those things perturb the motion of the spacecraft. So if we couple our models of that spacecraft motion with the tracking data we get from the DSN, this is how it works, at least in this little 2D example. And now, like before, I have, I have a space with a reference system. Um, and in this example, I'm going to look at one-way data with a bad clock. So I don't have DSEC right now. And I have a single DSN station that's in view of a satellite. And the other thing that I know about this in this little experiment is I'm on a trajectory that's a straight line traveling at a constant velocity. That's a key piece of information for this to work. So the DSN station will get its first measurement to my, to them, my spacecraft. It's a measure of range. And like before, I can be anywhere on, that, on this curve, because that's the same range here as it is here. And this band represents the error in my local spacecraft clock. I get another one at some later time. So it's not, it's not four measurements at the same time. It's at a different time. So I've moved. And so now the range to, to the spacecraft has changed. And I can be anywhere here. And I take another one, and I take another one. I have four pieces of information right now. And for my little simple model of a straight line motion with a constant velocity, that's actually enough to figure out where I'm at. But I have this problem. I have this large clock error. I could pick a solution like this. And this is perfectly satisfactory given the conditions I have in this problem. I could also pick that solution. That works. Both of these solutions are wrong. In fact, the right solution is that. But my data is not good enough to tell me that solution. So let's switch the scenario a little bit. Now we're getting two-way data. That's the way we do it today. Or we're getting one-way data with DSAC on board that spacecraft. <clears throat> Same thing. We get our first range measurement, our second, third, and fourth. But now you'll notice that my line is very narrow. That's because my clock is very accurate, or my two-way measurement is very accurate. In fact, the one-way data with DSAC is as accurate as the two-way data that we get today. Now I'm going to fit my line. I know it's a straight line. I know it's a constant velocity. That's the only line that works in this little example. And the reason why it works is because I have this precision measurement of range. So you can imagine this is a very simple example. It's a lot more complicated in real life, and it is. But fundamentally, this is how it works. So what does DSEC mean? for the future of navigation in deep space. This is the way it works today. So I've 
I've chosen another example to illustrate the flexibility and the scalability that DSEC implies for the way we do deep space, deep space navigation. We have a lot of orbiters and rovers on the surface of Mars today. Here's an example. We've got four orbiters at Mars. We've got maybe a spacecraft that's going to land on Mars. And we're going to try and track to each of these vehicles using two-way tracking. Well, today, you have a DS antenna, DS antenna, and it will communicate with that spacecraft and get its two-way tracking. But because it's a two-way link, it's the only vehicle that's getting that tracking. So to get tracking on that orbiter, you need another antenna. And unfortunately, none of these satellites are getting any tracking. They have the timeshare. If all of these vehicles had DSAC and they're using one-way tracking, we can take advantage of the fact that the DSN can listen to more than one spacecraft at a time. It can listen to actually two, and there are plans to upgrade that to four. And so in this example, um, this spacecraft and that spacecraft can get the needed tracking for um, orbit determination or navigation. And in fact, this antenna is always, there is always an antenna broadcasting to Mars. You could track a signal on the uplink. And what's neat about uplink tracking is it's like a broadcast signal, like GPS or transit. It's a, it doesn't require this satellite to talk back to the DSN station. So anybody listening in can get one-way tracking that's good enough for navigation as long as they have DSAC. And furthermore, and this is leading to the latter part of the talk, is not only could you collect that data on board, now you have the possibility of processing it on board for autonomous navigation. So I'm going to let Alan talk now about how atomic clocks actually work. And then when he's done, we'll talk about how DSAC can be used for future navigation and exploration. All right, thank you. Thank you. This is not an atomic clock. <laughs> this is a sundial. Sundials have been used for the last 2,700 years, as far as we can tell, probably even earlier than that. But until the 1800s, sundials were considered the correct time. Even though we had pendulum clocks after that, um, until the 1800s, pendulum clocks weren't considered accurate enough. Now, a sundial works by measuring how the shadow of the sun is cast onto a flat plate. And there are lots of different variations of sundials. If you check out the Wikipedia article on sundial, you will learn that there are more sundials than there are types of clocks, probably. And they were invented over the centuries to solve problems that sundials have, like their accuracy varies with the time of year, because the Earth is not in a circular orbit around the sun. It's actually uh, an ellipse, and the shadow moves around a little bit. But in the 1800s, uh, or actually in the in the um, Christian Huygens, the same Huygens of Saturn and Titan uh, fame, actually invented the first practical pendulum clock in, back in the 1600s. And um, these clocks work by measuring how much time it takes for a pendulum to swing. And that's a thing, that's a property of pendulums. It doesn't matter how heavy are, they are, it just matters how long they are. And that determines how much time they take to swim, swing back and forth. A sundial is an example of what's called an absolute clock. You don't have to do any adding. You just read right off the face what time it is. A pendulum clock, you have to add up all the swings. And like you've heard Todd talk about those bars being wide, these clocks where you have to add up these swings have errors. And every time you add the swings together, you add more and more errors. So pendulum clocks were not, were not good enough until they were engineered to be better than sundials only about 200 years ago. So after pendulum clocks in the 1920s, in the late 1920s, the quartz crystal clock was invented. Now that's the clock that's probably in your wristwatch, probably in your alarm clock if you still have one. A lot of people just use their phones for everything now. But quartz crystal clocks, as Todd mentioned, rely on a different principle than a pendulum clock, but it's still something moving. It's a little piece of rock, quartz, that when it's placed in an electric field, it vibrates. And, it, and because of the shape, it's very precisely shaped. And because of the shape, it only vibrates at a certain frequency or a certain number of ticks. And just like a pendulum clock, a quartz clock, which is an order of magnitude over 10 times more accurate than a pendulum clock, it's still adding up these little ticks. 
And this Todd keeps saying, it's just not good enough for navigation. 